Good to be with you this morning, and uh, great to minister in the church of my dear friend, Pastor Scott, who I really got to know in New Zealand on the other side of the world. Uh, turn with me, please, to Hebrews 12. <clears throat> Hebrews 12. <clears throat> We are going to read the first 13 verses. Hear the word of God. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, that is Jesus, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds." You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives." If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? But if you be without chastisement or of all our partakers, then are you illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be into, in subjection unto the father of spirits and live. For they, that's our earthly fathers, verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, that's God, chastens us for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. May God bless the reading of his word. So this pericope of 13 verses, I believe is the best theological chapter on how to cope with affliction in all the Bible. And basically what it's saying is if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, when afflictions come, it's not your God punishing you, it's your Father chastening you. In fact, if your father doesn't chasten you and mature you, the author to the Hebrews is saying, you're an illegitimate child. If you think to go through the Christian life with the health and wealth gospel people where they think that you have no afflictions if you're a believer, you're not reading your Bible. The Bible says that God will have afflict his children, chastening us, rubbing the rough, rough edges off of us, maturing us, so that we can live more for his glory, and so that we can be more conformed to Christ, to be a partaker, look at verse 10 and 11, of his holiness and of his righteousness. And I know what you're going to say, and the author knew what you were going to say, you're going to say, but it's no fun to be afflicted. It's not pleasant. Well, that's what he says in verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous but grievous, 
But afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are exercised thereby. The word exercised there simply means, uh, it, the, the Greek word is gymnasium, from which we get gymnasium. God brings us into his gymnasium, and he pummels us. He gets a spiritual flab, as it will, off of us by pummeling us, and we must not run away from the gymnasium. We must be exercised by him so that we grow in grace and become more conformed to the image of Christ. So that's, that's the overall gist of it. Our fathers, our earthly fathers, chastened us. Yes, in a fatherly way, but sometimes they were a little more lenient. Sometimes they were a little tougher on us according to their pleasure. But God always, always chastens us for our profit. Have you ever seen believers who are really chastened a lot by God, afflicted a lot? Generally, they're very mature people, aren't they? And they live out of Christ in very rich ways. And so if I'm going to be exercised by God in his gymnasium through affliction, and he's going to lead me more and more to Christ, so I become a partaker of Christ's righteousness and holiness, why should I be so afraid of afflictions? That's the conclusion. Verse 12. Wherefore, if this is all true, wow, lift up your hands, which hang down, and your feeble knees, and make a straight path for your feet. Because this is all working together for good. This is all part of Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for those who love God, because God will mature us and make us fruitful, make us useful when he's exercised us in his gymnasium. Now, that's just a real quick bird's eye view of this passage. But what I want to say to you is this, this morning. Your greatest problem, your greatest question, I'm sure, is not the question of, well, do I know what it means to be afflicted? We all do. There's no use spending time describing that. We've all been afflicted in our lives. It, it comes with the territory of being a fallen child of, of Adam. I'm not going to spend time this morning talking to you about the grievousness of affliction. No one wants to be afflicted. I'm not even going to talk to you this morning about the fact that all affliction comes to us from a wise, fatherly God, beyond what I've already said. Deep down, you know that. Deep down, you also know, if you know your Bible, and I'm sure you do a bit with such good preaching here, you know that the amount of our affliction is not a one-to-one -one correlate with the amount of our sin. That's what the whole book of Job is all about. His friends thought, well, Job, you must have sinned badly because you're getting afflicted badly. God says, no, no, no. I'm sovereign in how much I afflict my children. So that's not the question. The question is probably not even, if I do get afflicted in the future, how will I cope with it? You, 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 can't, you kind of put those things into the future. Or the question probably is not for you. When I look back at my afflictions, when I look back at them, how, how can I see that they work together for good? Now, most of you can say that, I'm sure. I'm sure you look back in your life and you say, even now, this morning, if God had never afflicted me, I'd just end up being a spoiled Spoiled child of God. I've needed every affliction he's given me. Everything has worked together for good. Are you there with me? I hope so. But your question and my question is, when I'm in the furnace of affliction, how do I keep walking? How do I keep running the race of, of verses one and two? What is the answer for, for hanging on, for clinging to God in the midst of affliction? And I've been, through, I've been through a good share of affliction myself in my life. And I've tried all kinds of things, quite frankly, how to cope. But I'm here this morning to tell you there's one thing 
that helps you cope with affliction and helps mature you more than all the other things and helps combined. And you find it in verse 3, the first three words. And that's what I want to speak about with you this morning. The first three words. For, consider, him. That's it. The way to go through affliction is to consider the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to suggest to you 10 ways this morning to consider the Lord Jesus Christ. You ready? Number one, number one, consider the passion, the passion of Christ. Passion, you know, comes from the Latin word passio, which means his sufferings. Consider what he went through. What greater source of strength is there for you going through affliction than to look at the afflictions of Jesus? And he suffered all those, if you're a true believer, he suffered all those for you. So that you might have strength to go through your afflictions following behind him. If you look back at Hebrews 4 a moment, Hebrews 4.15 there's just wonderful text. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched, double negative, which means strong positive. We absolutely have a high priest who absolutely is touched, not just by the feeling of our infirmities and then goes on his own way, but with the feeling of our infirmities, he enters into it with us. Why? Because he was in all points all points means all points. Tempted or tried like as we are, yet without sin. That's amazing. So that means every affliction you'll ever have to go through, Jesus in essence went through that same kind of affliction. But he did it sinlessly. So that he can sanctify you from the storehouse of his merits when you go through affliction. And the fact that he's gone through much more affliction than all of us combined ought to be a great comfort to us. That he understands. He's not only almighty God, Hebrews 4, 14, who's penetrated the heavens and is almighty to help us from the right hand of the Father. But he's also understanding man. He's understanding man, bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh. He's entered through affliction in a preeminent way. No one has ever suffered like Jesus. He's taken all the hell that you and I deserve. He's born it all. He's carried it all. He's conquered hell. He's conquered death. He's conquered grave. He cried out the cry of dereliction in the furnace of affliction when God pushed him away with both hands. Not as he does to us, seemingly pushing us away with one hand, but secretly drawing us with the other. So that Christ cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, as a pastor, we pastors know what it's like to shepherd people when they hear that awful word penetrating their lives, you've, you've got cancer. And it's, it's a shock to people almost every time. First, there's a numbness. There's, there's a, almost a disbelief. This can't really be happening to me. Then there's questions. And, but eventually the day arrives, they've got to go, they've got to, go to the office and they're going to get chemotherapy or radiation. And they sit in a room with a lot of other people with cancer. And a very common conversation is that when you call them afterward and say, how, how did the first chemotherapy go? They say, well, pastor, uh, I, something, something kind of special happened to me. I was sitting in that room and I looked around and I, I, I saw I didn't really, I don't really have it so bad. I saw people in a lot worse shape than me. And uh, yeah, in some kind of strange way, it just kind of comforted me that I've got to count my blessings. You see, uh, that's helpful to know that <laughs> we always deserve worse because we deserve nothing but 
hell and death, right? We're sinners. But people have it worse than us. But you see, with Jesus, it's different. He not only had it worse than us, but he did it for us that we might have the strength to go through whatever affliction he and his sovereign inscrutable wisdom determined to lay upon us so that there's no affliction that ever will come upon you that he won't also give a way of escape, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that you may be able to bear it. So when you consider the sufferings of Christ, what he did for you, when he was perfectly innocent, and what you deserve because you're a sinner, you can bow under your sufferings and say, Lord Jesus, the sufferings I taste remind me of the deeper sufferings that you have suffered for me. And then there can be a sweetness a sweetness in our pain. You know, I heard that an old Scottish preacher who is now with the Lord tell this powerful story of this um, blacksmith in his church who was a, is a huge guy, like 275 pounds, just a big muscle-bound blacksmith working all his life, pounding on the anvil. And uh, the guy got cancer and he whittled away to 90 pounds. Suffered incredibly. And one time, uh, the pastor's name was Douglas McMillan. He, he went to see him. And uh, the man was just groaning in bed. And uh, uh, Douglas McMillan said to him, uh, Oh, brother, you're having a bad day, aren't you? No, no, the guy said. No, you're not having a bad day? Are you in pain? Yes. Are you in great pain? Yes. But you're not having a bad day? No. Why not? He whispered, Pastor, I've never realized the value of Christ's sufferings until now. I'm having a good day. You see, Consider the sufferings of Christ. That will help you. That will help you get through the greatest sufferings. And I had an experience with a lady who was in the hospital 70 times before she died. Visited her every one of those times. And uh, one time I was walking into the room and I saw her face grimaced with pain. And the grimace was so bad, I actually stepped back out of the room. I thought, this is no time to visit her. But she had caught a glimpse of me. And she called to me, Pastor, come on in. So I came in and I said to her, well, you're really, you're really in pain, aren't you? Oh, yes, she said. And then she gave me a full smile and she said, but it's nothing compared to what my Savior's gone through. See, that helps you. That helps you. All right, number two, consider the power of Christ, the power of Christ. If he, being infinite God-man, received power on earth to bear infinite sufferings on your behalf, and through the merit of these sufferings, he now receives a right and royal power in heaven from his Father to rule and strengthen you in all your sufferings, as he's promised to do, why should you complain? In other words, if I translate this relative to his heaven-earth power into your life, I would say it like this. If he desires to weigh you down with affliction, even staggering affliction, do not be alarmed, but look to him for strength, because he is almighty. He is almighty God with whom nothing is impossible. He will carry you through by his divine strength. Now, he will determine exactly how much you can carry. It's like a good tailor. He makes 
a suit for a man's shoulders. Not too wide, not too tight. God tailor makes all our afflictions and fits them to our own, may I say, spiritual shoulders. George Downame, a Puritan, said this, the Lord does not measure out our afflictions according to our faults and sins, but according to our strength, and looks not at what we have deserved, but at what we are able to bear. So if you're going through great affliction, it just may mean that God is just maturing you more than he matures most people, and that's a good thing. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down. I was 13 years old the first summer my dad hired me. My dad was a carpenter. And I had two older brothers who had been working for him. And uh, we were shingling a roof one day. And I, my two brothers, they, you know, a pile of shingles is pretty heavy, as you know. They flipped up the whole pile on their shoulders. They walked up the ladder like nothing, slapped it down on the roof. And, and my shoulders were, were, were quite slender at that time. I was one of those skinny kids. And I took a bundle of shingles and I tried to get it up on my shoulder and it was barely, I was barely able to get it there. And I was going up the ladder. It's like, whoa, I felt like I was going to fall backward and my heart was racing. And I finally got up there and I slapped that thing down and wow, that was scary. When I got back down on the ground, my dad was there waiting for me. He says, son, next time take half a bundle. When you're older and your shoulders can bear it, you can do like your brothers, but you're not there yet. You see, God knows exactly how big your spiritual shoulders are, how mature you are. And he's promised to give you not more than what you can bear, 1 Corinthians 10. So trust him. He will give you the strength and the grace for each affliction as each affliction comes. Now, this is an important thing for a child of God to understand. When you think right now of the future, there are certain things that you think, right? I, I've got a couple of those too. I just hope that doesn't happen to me because I, I don't know if I could handle that. I had a lady in my church whose mother died from a very painful kind of cancer. And she's a very mature woman. She said to me one day, she said, Pastor, God's been so good to me in all my afflictions in life. I've surrendered everything to him. And I can honestly say that whatever he sends my way, whatever he sends my way, I can bow under it because I trust him. But the only thing I ask him is, Lord, just the only thing, please don't give me the kind of cancer my mother had. And guess what happened? She got the kind of cancer her mother had. And it was painful. But she walked through it like a trooper. She was always praising the Lord. Except one night, one night she felt like Satan got a hold of her. And she felt like she couldn't find the Lord. And her husband called me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And she was in pain. And I was at the bedside and reading scripture to her and praying. But by morning light, she was out of it again. So one time it seemed to overwhelm her. But... Even then, you see, she didn't despair. God helped her. God gives grace to the measure that grace is needed to go through any affliction that he'll ever put upon you. Consider the power of Christ. Number three, consider the presence of Christ. The presence of Christ. The Heidelberg Catechism said, I just love Lord's Day 18 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Perhaps you know it. The question is something about like this, it translated to today's language. But if Christ goes up into heaven and is no longer with us on earth, isn't that to our detriment? And the answer is, he is at no time absent from you, for he abides with us with his Godhead, with his majesty, with his grace, and with his Holy Spirit. What an answer. He abides with you, with his Godhead, majesty, grace, and Holy Spirit. He is always present. Robert Murray McShane said, 
How would your prayers differ if every time you bowed your knees in your bedroom and you're all alone, if you knew that Jesus was standing right beside you? Well, McShane says, he is. He's omnipresent. He's always there. He's always with you. He's never absent. In all your dark afflictions, your high priest retains you in his high priestly eye. He preserves you in his high priestly heart. He bears you on his high priestly shoulders. He doesn't remove you from the engravings of his high priestly hands. And he never ceases to remember you in his high priestly intercessions. Hebrews 7.25, he ever lives to make intercession for them. That's the true believer. If you're a true believer, he is interceding for you every single second of your life. How can he do that? He's infinite. He intercedes for all of his people at once. He's infinite. But he's also infinite in treating each one of his children like he or she were his only child. So he's praying for you right now, right now, right now, right now, always. He's never absent. What a comfort that is. Yes, but what about when I'm, he's my elder brother, but what about when I'm very unbrotherly to him? When I forget him or when I sin against him in my thoughts or, or even my words or actions, what about then? Well, he will not desert his own. Your unbrotherliness to Christ never unbrothers this precious elder brother from you. He loves you even more than a mother loves a child, Isaiah 49 says. If you hurt your mother in some way, does she just own you as a child? No, she loves you still. Much more so, Jesus. So, the Jesus who never failed you in all of yesterday's afflictions and who will give you strength for every future affliction, won't he help you through today? Sometimes I think it's like standing at ocean's edge. Have you ever stood at ocean's edge when there's a, there's a pretty good storm out at sea and the waves are coming in and when you look at them about 100 feet away, you think, they're going to wipe me out. But by the time they break in onto the beachhead of where you're standing, they just go over your ankles or maybe up to your knees. You won't drown. He'll keep you. He'll calm your fears. He'll bring you through. And as afflictions break in on the beachhead of your life, they won't overwhelm you. When the fires of affliction come, not one of your hairs will be singed. The fourth one, who's, in the who's really the first one, will be with you as he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the burning fiery furnace. And you'll come out sanctified, more mature. He's always present. The world has a hard time understanding that. They don't understand the beauty, the joy of a Christian who knows that Jesus is always there, always there. Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace. Oh, we, we threw three men in. Who's that fourth one? It's Jesus. I say he's the first one. He knows every furnace you get thrown into, also by those who persecute you. And he's walking with you. He unties the ties with which you're bound. He enables you to walk freely in the furnace because he's with you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Consider Christ's presence. Number four, consider Christ's perseverance. Jesus, having loved his own, loved them to the end. He never flinched. He never turned back. Yes, once he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But he also said, the same moment, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He set his face toward Jerusalem. 
You see, he persevered to the end. And we persevere through his perseverance. We are preserved through his preservation. We keep going because he kept going to the end. And he will give us strength to follow him. We take the light end, the non-meritorious end of the cross. He takes the heavy one. We're the Simon of Cyrene that comes behind him taking the light end of the cross. He'll help us through. He'll help us persevere. Yes, you say, but I've got affliction that's been going on for decades now, and it, there's no end to it. And I, I, sometimes I feel like I can't live another day. I can't take another step. I, I can't go on. It's overwhelming. He'll help you. He who persevered to the end will give you strength to take one more step, to go one more day, to bring you through. And to calm the wind and the waves and all those fears, those internal anxieties. He can do it. He will do it. He's a specialist in doing it. He's, he's the spiritual physician. It's beautiful. You know, David said, just imagine this. David's, David's anointed king. And for 16 years after he's anointed, Saul is hounding him, trying to find him, throwing javelins at him. And finally, David is about ready to give up. He can't take it anymore, he thinks. He says, I shall one day perish at the hand of Saul. Did he? <laughs> no. Why? Because Christ gave him persevering grace through his own perseverance. You see, Christ, in the language of Hebrews 4.15, holds his people fast so that we hold him fast. And we persevere through his perseverance. Number five, consider the prayers of Christ. The prayers of Christ. How he intercedes for you. How he prays for you. How he hears every whisper. You know, I find it fascinating in Mark 10. Don't you? Have you ever thought about this? Bartimaeus is crying out by the wayside. He's got a little can, hoping for a little dime or a quarter, perhaps, from some passerby that he can survive. But he hears that Jesus is passing by. And he's heard the wonders of, that Jesus has done. And he cries out, Jesus of Nazareth, be merciful to me, a sinner. But Jesus is surrounded by a great multitude, we read. And he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's already feeling the weight of the sins of his people on his shoulders. Certainly he's not going to hear the cry of that miserable beggar at the side of the road. What does the Bible say? That Jesus stood still. And he commanded the beggar to be called to him. Isn't that amazing? He hears that cry. In the state of humiliation when he's overwhelmed with sorrow himself. But now, he's above all sorrow, above all humiliation. He's at the right hand of the Father. And as, as, as Samuel Rutherford said, his ear is tuned to this earth to hear the faintest whisper of the needy child of God. He will hear the needy when they cry. And so when you're afflicted, cry out to him. Have you, ever, have you ever realized that one of the greatest reasons God afflicts us is so that we, we pray. We truly pray. When we're in prosperity, we have so many prayers that don't go above the ceiling. Well, we pray, but we don't pray. We don't pray in our prayer. We just say words. But when we're afflicted, most of our best prayers, most of our truest prayers, most of our deepest prayers are circumstantially motivated by the engine of affliction. It's when we cry out to God from the depths of our soul. Maybe it's because of our indwelling sin. Maybe it's because, you know, your spouse just got cancer. Or maybe it's because you just lost your job. But you learn to cry out in prayer. You pray through the praying Christ. Prayer is such a beautiful thing, such a great help. Even knowing that other people are praying for you can help. But knowing that Jesus is praying for you, moment by moment, as I said moments ago, that's the greatest help of all. See, prayer is a beautiful thing. Prayer is a Trinitarian thing. 
It goes like this. If you watch my hand a moment, prayer comes from above. It comes from the Father's eternal decree. The Father decrees every true prayer. Jesus Christ comes down into this world. It's like a golden necklace. And he merits, he merits our right to pray as well as the gift of prayer. And he sends his Holy Spirit into our lives to groan within us, groanings that are unutterable, and then those prayers go back up to Christ who sanctifies them, insults them with the salt of his own sufferings, makes them pure and acceptable in the sight of the Father, and then presents them to the Father accepted in his sight. It's Father, Son, Spirit, Son, Father. It's like a golden necklace. A golden chain is what William Perkins called it. The gift of prayer. And he who is the prayer giving, prayer decreeing, prayer hearing will also be the prayer answering God. Consider the prayers of Christ and how he teaches you to pray through the merits of his own prayers. You see, a prayerless affliction is like an open sore ripe for infection, but a prayerful affliction is like an open sore ripe for the balm of Gilead the healing ointment of Jesus' blood. That's why the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Number six, consider the promises of Christ. The promises of Christ. The Bible has 3,500 promises for you, dear child of God. 3,500. And every one of them is an encouragement to pray. Every one of them is like a peg for you to cling to to hold on to, to say, Lord, do as thou hast said. And we all have our favorite promises. I'll give you one of mine. I I love Romans 8, 28. All things will work together for good to them that love God. Sometimes afflictions come my way, just like you. you You can't even imagine in your wildest imagination how this can work together for good. But God promises it. And on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, When he calls you to enter into glory and you walk through the gates of celestial bliss, you will understand every detail of your life was needed, every detail was needed that you could be exactly the individual child of God you were with all your set of afflictions and it all worked together for good to bring you to glory to praise Christ forever. Hallelujah. He's wonderful. His promises are him. He's the essence of the promises. One Puritan said, God's promises, God's gospel, and God's God's promises, God's gospel, and God's son are nearly synonyms. All the promises of God are yea and amen in who? In Christ Jesus. So you plead those promises when you're in affliction. One time in my life, I was going through some very deep ways, and uh, one of my daughters noticed it and uh, was very concerned about me. And the next morning, I was walking down, downstairs, and um, um, the head door jam, there was some tape on it, and there were six sheets of paper beneath it, all taped together, eight and a half by 11 sheets, and there was a promise Romans 8, 28 was there. There were six promises. Promises that she heard me tell stories about in family worship that had been made dear to me. And when I came down for breakfast, I had to walk right through that pathway. These promises are all staring me in the face. It was wonderful. In fact, I didn't take them down until we had some company come over about a week later. But I just, I wanted to walk through them every single day and remind myself of these promises. You you want help in the midst of affliction? Take those promises, especially that have been made very dear for you and and paste them to your computer, paste them to your refrigerator, paste them on your walls, read them every day, plead them, cling to the promises. Consider Christ, he's true to his promises. Number seven. Consider the plenitude of Christ, the plenitude of Christ. The Bible says in him there's bread enough and to spare. Christ is so rich. I I think of it this way. We have 100,000 books in our seminary library. 
basically all of them are about Christ, directly or indirectly. And John says, the whole world could be full of books and you couldn't exhaust the fullness of Christ. Think of the infinitude that lies just in him as office bearer, as prophet, as priest, as king, in his states of humiliation, exaltation, in his, in his nature as God and man. It, it, there is just no end to Christ. So that Paul says Christ is all and in all. He'll take care of you. He's promised. You're, he's your elder brother. He's your savior. He's your Lord. He's your nearest kinsman. He's not going to let you go. Consider his plenitude. Number eight, consider the preciousness of Christ. You know the Bible uses the word precious 75 times, but most of all, it uses it of the blood of Jesus, his precious blood. From beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, from the closing of the gates of Eden to the opening of the gates of the heavenly Zion, blood runs through Scripture, uniting all of Scripture. Substitutionary blood of the Son of God. How precious is that blood? Consider that blood, the capability of that blood to bring you full orb redemption. That, the capability of that blood to justify you be now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. The capability of that blood to sanctify you, by his stripes we are healed. The capability of that blood to preserve you and assure you and make you victorious over hell and death. The capability of that blood to open the gates of heaven for you. It's the only reason why you'll get into heaven. It's because you have the blood passport in your hand of Jesus Christ. We're from Michigan and close to Canada there. And um, I did a wedding some years back and there was a best man who uh, forgot his passport when he tried to come across the border from Ontario into Michigan. And he said to the guard, at the, <laughs> I'm so sorry, sir, but I forgot my passport, but, but I have to go. I, I'm the best man in the wedding. You have to let me in. And the guy said, I'm sorry, young man, but you're not going in. You gotta go back and get your passport. He had to miss the wedding. See, if you try to get into heaven with anything but the blood of Christ, you'll be ejected. Without the, remission, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. You've got, to, you've got to be grounded in the blood of Christ alone. That's gotta be your... Total salvation, not 90%, not 99%, 100%, but where you are resting only on the blood of Christ. That blood will be strong enough, not just for your salvation, but also your preservation. Yeah, that, that blood will not let you go. Number nine, consider the purposes of Christ. He lived to do his Father's will. And his father's will was that he would present his church without spot or wrinkle to his father. And it's through affliction that he sharpens you, matures you, teaches you, and prepares you for glory. Listen to me here. Here's what the Bible says. Sanctified affliction humbles you. God knows that's good for us. Deuteronomy 8 verse 2. Sanctified affliction teaches you what sin is, what a monster it is. Zephaniah 1 verse 12, that's good for us. And sanctification teaches us to seek God early, says Hosea 5.15. That's good for us. You see, affliction vacuums away the fuel that feeds our pride so that we become dependent beggars at the footstool of mercy, where God wants us to be. John Bunyan says something so beautiful. He said, God's people are like bells. You know, in the old days when they had to just really hit the church bells really hard, so they'd ring through the city. Well, that's what he's talking about. He said, God's people are like bells. The harder they're hit, the better they sound. So you learn more from the rod that strikes you 
than from the staff that comforts you. You discover the truth of Robert Layton's words, affliction is the diamond dust that heaven polishes its jewels with. So sanctified affliction does so much for us. It keeps us close to Christ in communion with him. That's a good thing. It keeps us close by his side. It makes us partaker of his suffering and image, his righteousness and holiness. That's a good thing. It rubs the rust off of our locked hearts and opens our hearts' gates afresh to our king's presence chamber. That's a good thing. It weans us from this world. That's a good thing. I love Thomas Watson's quotation about that. He said, God will give us enough affliction so that the world hangs like a loose tooth in our mouth, easily being twitched away, doth not much bother us. Could you live without Christ for a month? What would be harder, to live without him for a month or live without your worldly toys and your worldly habits for a month? And then number 10, consider the plan of Christ. The plan is that he's preparing you to be with him forever. Eternal glory, not just for himself, but for you. That's why the Bible often prepare, often speaks of, of this life as just like 10 days. 10 was the number of fullness. Or you have a 10-day trial. You see, the 10 days here are preparation for glory to come. Well, our lives are like a flower that blooms in yeah. I know most women like flowers a lot. My, my wife actually says, I, I've got her some flowers sometimes, and she says, you know, yeah, it's kind of a waste of money. It's just around a few days and they're gone. Uh, well, that's what life is like. You know, you blink a couple times. You blink a couple times and you're an adult. You blink twice more and your kids are graduating from high school. And then they're married and and suddenly you've got grandkids, and that, that's fun, but you blink a couple times, and the grandkids are growing up, and, and, and you die. Life is short compared to eternity. So God uses this little 10-day life, this little short time, to prepare us for a never, 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 never ending eternity. So we ought to look at all of our afflictions as preparation ground, preparing us to be with him Forever. The Puritan John Trapp said, Don't begrudge God a few rainy days here on earth. He that rides to be crowned will not think much of a few rainy days. You're on your way to glory, dear child of God. Don't expect your heaven on earth. A poet puts it this way, light after darkness, gain after loss, strength after weakness, crown after cross, sweet after bitter, hope after fears, home after wandering, praise after tears, sheaves after sowing, sun after rain, sight after mystery, peace after pain, joy after sorrow, calm after blast, rest after weariness, sweet rest at last. So remember, You're just a renter here, a temporary renter. Your personal mansion is reserved in glory. The shepherd's rod, the shepherd's rod has honey at the end. Don't despair. Your afflictions are imposed by a fatherly hand of love in the context of grace, not, as you're too prone to think, by a punitive hand of judgment in the context of works. So press on and say with Paul, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. I'll take whatever he sends my way. I'll trust him. Let me close with this illustration. There was, um, you know how a Persian rug is is made. There's the rug maker who climbs up a ladder, gets on some scaffolding. He calls down to his workers and they hand him up whatever color string he asks for. Brown, black, which symbolize kind of affliction or, or lighter colors. And as they watch the pattern from underneath, all they see is these dangling strings hanging down, seem to have no pattern at all. It's all confusing. They're all intertwined. It makes no sense. 
And then the day comes when the rug maker is done with the whole rug. And he says, workers, come up higher. And they climb the ladder. And instead of the workers, that they never fail to be impressed when they get a first glance at that rug. It is so beautiful. And every dark string is needed to make the pattern just perfect and unique. Well, our lives are like that, dear believers. And when we walk through the gates of pearly bliss, it'll be like God saying to us, my friend, come up higher. And it's as if he'll throw, may I say it figuratively, throw the rug of our lives in front of us and we'll see that we're like no other rug. We're unique. But every dark string of affliction is perfectly planned in the right place so that there's a beauty to the whole. God makes no mistakes. And on the day of days, you will say, I've needed every affliction I've ever received. So consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. And hear the poet, my life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot see the pattern he weaveth steadily. Sometimes he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly will he unveil the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the skillful weaver's hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. For consider Christ. Christ.